just kind of looking over our guests and seeing who's all here. Um, checking to see if we have anybody because this is co-hosted by um, the Wisconsin uh, Reading League chapter in Illinois, or I'm sorry, the Illinois chapter of uh, of the Reading League. So if there's anybody here, I'll give a minute, wait time, four seconds. Yeah, maybe folks could just uh, in chat give their names and where they where they're from. That'd be great. Sounds lovely. As everyone's connecting, I just want to welcome you all. We're very excited it's for you to join us this evening. Um, and we are as the chapter of the Reading League Wisconsin is so excited to have you here with us um, and hang out with Joan Sedita. So Joan is an experienced educator. Um, she is the mastermind, um, a little bit around keys to literacy, um, as well as the writing rope, um, which is why we're here. Uh, I can give you the lowdown or I can just give you the link to her slides and I imagine she'll tell us. Um, but in 2007, she founded the Keys to Literacy and is the CEO of the company. Um, and she continues to develop professional development programs and mentors Keys to Literacy. Um, she created the writing rope, um, I would say, I think 2019. 18, 19. 18, 19. Okay. I was like, I knew it was COVID time. And so now that's how we master it. It's like, a, B, B, C. Um, and this framework of writing instruction, and she is the leader of the professional development. Joan, you're joining us from Massachusetts. Yeah. Um, and so we're so excited you're here. And when you're ready, you're welcome to share your screen. Thank you, everybody from coming who's joined us here from what Mequon and Iowa and New York, Oregon. This is awesome. The requisite New Zealand attendee. We all have lots of Canada. We have California. We've got East Coast. So yeah. um, welcome, everybody. I'm going to just post in the chat the um, link to Joan's um, handouts tonight so that you have that there. Yeah, thank you so much. And thanks to uh, both re Reading League groups for hosting this tonight. Um, the handout that's being linked to from the chat uh, has a copy of my slides for tonight. And then uh, also the first couple of pages, there are a couple of things like the second page is a, a big version of the writing rope in case you want that. On the very front page, um, kind of like a title page, I've given some um, information and links for a whole bunch of free things that uh, that you can get at the Keys to Literacy website, some recorded webinars, downloads, articles, that kind of thing, some of which I will refer to. So um, it's, it's a good idea to access the handouts. That'd be great. Um, so we're going to talk to tonight about the framework, the writing rope. I'm going to hit the mountaintops of the different strands in the rope. Um, and I hope to make this practical. So what I'll try to do for each strand is bring in at least one kind of uh, how-to how or practical tip, something that's an instructional suggestion you can use with your students. Because I, um, while the framework is important to know, I also like to try to make connections to the classroom. And I will be drawing from three books tonight. Um, one, obviously, The Writing Rope, that, that one's published by Brooks. But I'm also going to be bringing in some instructional suggestions from two other books that I wrote that go with the uh, early writing, which is K2, and content writing 3 to 12 uh, courses that I've authored. So let's begin by talking a little bit about the rope. We'll, we'll look at big picture first. Um, and, and let me start by saying why I put the, this framework together, because I often get asked that question. Um, I actually originally, and for many years, used a different metaphor, a wagon wheel, and that, you know, just like there are spokes in a wagon wheel, right? And, and what happens if one or two of the spokes breaks, the, the wheel doesn't function well, right? It, it's a metaphor I've used a long time. And it, I felt that, that we needed something like that because, uh, you know, especially ever since the National Reading Panel in 2000, which identified what many of us you know, if I say the fab five, you know, the five components of reading and almost anybody who's involved in literacy and certainly elementary teachers, if you say, what are those five 
you know, they can give you a pretty good idea of that, right? Phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, comprehension. Okay. But when you say, what, what do you think are the components for teaching writing? Many of these same people are not sure. Uh, they tend to focus on one or two things, maybe transcription. So they, the, their reaction is it's spelling, it's handwriting, um, or maybe especially if they're in their upper grades, they focus on some of the critical thinking thing, skills that you need to answer prompts like on state assessments. So people kind of are, are all over with it. Um, the other thing that I, I've seen happen, especially over the last 20 years, is that as the emphasis on writing instruction and the importance of making sure we have dedicated time, especially in the early grades, to teaching reading, which has been a great thing. However, I think whatever writing instruction was happening, we've lost some of that too. So the idea is to just get it front and center for folks. Now, back in 2018, when I was um, I was doing a workshop about this, I started with the wagon wheel, and then I realized that, you know, Hollis Scarborough's reading rope had started to become popular at that point. People were very aware of it. And I thought, well, if I use a similar metaphor, people might be able to connect with it better. So that's just a little bit of the background. Um, how How is this intended to be used? Well, by any teacher or administrator, any educator, to kind of look at what is your curriculum for writing? If you're thinking about buying a program, um, if you're thinking about looking at your writing lessons, are they complete? So it's kind of like a checklist sort of, right? To say, are we teaching all the skills and strategies that are involved in order to do proficient writing? So that's the purpose. I'm going to very quickly hit the mountaintops of each strand because then after I do a brief overview of what the research says about writing instruction, we will take each strand and go into it in a little more depth. So let's start at the bottom. And by the way, you'll see at the bottom of this slide, um, a URL that will bring you to the Keys to Literacy free resources webpage, which is also on your front page of your handouts, where in the article section, you can download one of my original blog post articles about the writing rope, um, which is a few pages long and kind of explains this a little bit further. So let's start at the bottom with transcription skills. And those basically are what it, what it says, right? They're the skills we need to literally transcribe words onto the page. So spelling and handwriting slash keyboarding. We'll talk a little bit about more about that in a minute. But students, by the time they leave grade three, going into four, need to be fluent in these skills so that they don't focus all their attention on that and can instead focus on composing. The next one up is writing craft. And this tends to be the purview of the writing teacher or the ELA teacher, right? So it's teaching kids um, about literary devices you can use. So for example, if you're writing a narrative and you have characters, how do you use dialogue? How do you use maybe figurative language? I also put in here word choice because for a lot of students who struggle with writing, they struggle because they don't have vocabulary and word choice is so important, right? So that our sentences aren't boring, right? And that we can find the words we need to say what we want to. And then finally, I also put in here awareness of what people refer to often as TAP, task, audience, and purpose. Because if you're thinking about that when you're writing, it will, it should steer you to make certain decisions. Uh, we'll talk more about that in a few minutes as well. The next one, the blue strand is text structure. And I really tucked quite a few things under here. So if we start at the broadest level, um, we're talking about the structures that are the same and different among different types of writing. And in particular, I focused on the three types that are found in common core state standards, which are opinion or argument as you get older, informational and narrative. And so how do you teach kids to write introductions to these and conclusions and, and how do you build the body of these major types of writing? Next level down is paragraph structure. And in a little bit, I'm gonna talk about how I believe that sentences and paragraphs are really the building blocks for being able to build a piece of writing. So paragraph structure, we need to make sure kids understand that. Uh, 
Also in here is patterns of organization, description, sequence, cause and effect, right? These are our patterns that depending on what we're trying to say in our writing, some of these patterns do a better job than others. And then finally, which is very much linked to these patterns, right, are what are called transition words and phrases, also sometimes called linking. And we use these words to connect our sentences and our paragraphs, but also to signal a pattern. Maybe it's first and next last, right, or on the other hand. So that's the text structure strand. Next up is syntax, or basically we're talking about sentences, right? So these are all the skills and strategies kids need in order to, number one, be able to write a complete sentence and then to build on that and do sentence elaboration. And so there are a lot of activities and instructional practices that will help students do this. But um, I really felt it deserved its own strand because it's such a fundamental part of writing. And, you know, we have a lot of older students who struggle. And when you look at why they're struggling, they're falling apart at the basic sentence level. And last but not least, we have critical thinking. There's quite a few things that can fall under here. The first thing I did was put the stages of the writing process here. Um, and there are lots of, uh, you know, different versions of what those stages are. They're all pretty similar. In a little bit, I'll share with you a model that we developed, make it easy for kids to remember, um, uh, think, plan, write, revise. But the point is that we need to explicitly teach students strategies that they need to use at every one of those stages. So strategies for how do you gather information? strategies for organizing. Maybe you're going to use a graphic organizer. So that's under critical thinking because it involves a lot of critical thinking, right? But the other thing, which is the very top bullet, is any skill or strategy that you need in order to write to learn, write about what you're reading, writing from sources, right? This is that, that really heavy duty thinking, uh, using writing to think. And so things like how do you, if you're um, writing answer to a prompt, let's say from sources, how do you um, gather that information and find that relevant information? How do you take notes on it? Um, how do you gather that information into a plan? So that's the writing rope kind of in a nutshell. And as I said, you should have a full page copy of that in the handouts. We're going to shift gears a little bit now, and I want to highlight for you what we know about writing instruction. And, you know, as I'm looking at this slide, it says grades four to 12, but I actually included um, one of the IES reports that goes right down to kindergarten. These four are all research guides, right? The authors and the, the teams of authors, they do meta analyses of the research related to the topic. And then they produce these guides that link the, the research. So they not only let you know what it is, but how does it play out in the classroom? So you can um, just Google any of these titles and access the full reports. And I highly suggest that you do that. But what I'm gonna do is give you the fastest tour of those reports in the next couple slides. So I just want to highlight what we what we know. In this case, this is from an Institute of Education Science report um, about what are the most effective instructional practices for the elementary grades. And they I came up with four recommendations. You see here them here on the slide. The first one's kind of obvious, right? Provide daily time for students to write. But the fact of the matter is we're not doing that. Um, in fact, after first or second grade, it's suggested that students spend at least an hour a day either in writing instruction or guided practice. Now that can happen during lots of subjects. Second recommendation was to teach students to use those stages in the writing process for lots of purposes. Um, writing isn't just writing a paragraph or writing a composition. Third, and this gets to that transcription uh, strand of the rope, right? That we need to make sure kids are fluent with handwriting and spelling, but the report also put in here the sentence construction. And then finally, this last one, create an engaged community of writers actually covers several things. 
It includes things like making sure we provide opportunities for students to work collaborative. Um, writing is a very uh, communicative thing. And we know from research that when students have a chance to collaborate with their peers at different levels of stages of the writing process, they will be more engaged. It also means creating a supportive environment where, where students feel comfortable writing. You know, let's face it, writing is hard. And I bet if I were to ask many of you, if you prefer to read over writing, most of you would say yes, because it's so difficult. And when we write, it's like we're bearing our soul. And so, you know, if we want people to give us feedback, um, it, that needs to happen in a, in a supportive environment. So those are the highlights as it relates to the IES early uh, or elementary report. These are the suggestions for the secondary level. Uh, number one, explicitly teach writing strategies. And that would be writing strategies, as I said, at all stages of the writing process. And notice what they talk about using a model practice reflect approach, which I bet many of you recognize more as the I do it, we do it, you do it, right? So the point is we can't assume that kids are gonna magically figure these skills out on their own. We've got to teach them to them. And sometimes teachers forget that when we're working with older students, we make that assumption that they have even the basic skills. The second recommendation was to integrate writing and reading. Um, there is so much that we, that we now know about how writing supports reading and reading supports writing. And in, in a minute, I'm gonna go over another report that delves into that a little bit more. And then finally, making sure that we use assessment to inform our instruction that's based on individual students' writing and the feedback we give them. It's not a one-size approach uh, to teaching writing at the upper grades. All right, another report, this one came out a bit earlier, was called Writing Next. It followed on the heels of Reading Next. And what they did was look at all the things that kept coming up in the research over and over again as statistically significant for moving the needle around getting kids writing better. And they identify the items you see on this slide, and they also put them in the order of which were most effective. They're all effective but they put them in order. Now I'm gonna, not gonna spend time on every one of them. I just wanna call your attention to a couple of things. Number one, look at summarizing. It comes in second. Summarizing turns out to be one of the most effective things we can do to improve comprehension, reading comprehension, but also writing. Um, let's also look at that collaborative writing, right? We were just talking about the value of that. Let's look at the bottom of the first column, sentence combining. This is like, what an amazing little activity. We're gonna try a little bit of it later to really improve kids' sentence writing. Uh, on the other column, look at study of models. This has to do with using mentor models as, as samples that kids emulate. And then finally, writing for content learning. So that's another really helpful report. The last one I'm gonna highlight was called writing to read. And this is a little different. They looked at all the research about how writing might support reading. And no surprise, turns out that it really does. Uh, I've highlighted the recommendations from that report here. The first one, they actually identified not just writing about what kids are reading, but they identified these very specific four things. So if we can have students writing personal reactions to text, uh, a good example of this would be if let's say students are reading a narrative and you have them do a journal um, responding to what did they think about the character and what the character did or changed or how did they feel about the setting? Second, look at that summarizing, there it co goes again, right? Third, note, and for any of you that are familiar with my work, you know I'm a real big fan of two column note taking, right? But we need to teach kids how to take notes about what they're reading. And then finally, not only to answer, but actually create questions of their own in writing about the text they're reading. Uh, second major re recommendation, we need to teach them the writing skills and processes, very similar to the other reports. And last but not least, make sure that our students are getting a lot of practice. Uh, I just wanted to bring up this slide. I'm sure so many of you have already heard of the gradual release. Um, again, most people now think about it as I, we, you. 
But the point I want to make about this is that research shows us that we can't just assume kids are going to figure out those skills and strategies that are in the writing rope. Every one of them requires explicit instruction. So maybe you're teaching kids how to use transitions or how to write a claim for an argument, right? Or how to write a topic sentence. It needs to start with the teacher modeling and being explicit and using think aloud, then providing lots of guided practice until the students are able to take it on on their own. Now, there's one more sort of setting the stage thing that I wanna touch on with you. And this is uh, something called the not so simple view of writing. Uh, the, the framework was developed by Virginia Berninger and colleagues oh, almost 20 years ago. Originally, they called it the simple view of writing. They changed it um, once they began to add a few things. Doesn't matter what you call it. The important point is what is it telling us? So if you look at this slide, the box on the top, text generation, really pretty much covers four out of the five strands of the writing row, right? How you write sentences, text structure, et cetera, et cetera. The box on the bottom, transcription, that's the bottom strand in the row. But what this adds is the role that the cognitive processes of executive functions play on making it easier or harder for kids to write. So I want you to think about kids you know who have weak executive functions. Maybe they actually have a diagnosis of ADHD, right? Um, it's those cognitive processes that we're born with. You cannot teach executive functions. What you can do though, is give kids scaffolds like graphic organizers and writing templates that will support the kids that have weaknesses with attention and goal setting and planning and revising, right? working memory plays a role. So my point in putting this slide up is I want you to number one, know what the not so simple view is, but also keep in mind as you work with students, especially those that have these difficulties, that it's gonna be a lot harder for them to learn to write and we need to provide a lot more support. Now, the last thing that uh, I wanna go over before we jump back into the uh, writing rope is just highlight what are some very common things that we see with students who have difficulty with writing. And this could be across all grade levels. You know, as I highlight these bullets, as the box on the bottom says, I would like you to be thinking about, are there some other things that you see over and over again with our kids who struggle? So often they're gonna lack critical reading skills. Um, if there's a problem with the writing, there's usually some issue with reading as well. They tend to lack an understanding of grammar concepts. So their sentences are very short, simple, sometimes not even complete. They have a difficult time editing their own writing or looking at the writing of others and giving feedback. They need explicit instruction on how to do that. They have a hard time creating a logical sequence. They're just not organized. They might not have any strategies for planning or pre-writing. They lack strong vocabulary. I mean, if they're having difficulty with literacy, they're not reading very much. Their vocabularies are not growing. And it can be very frustrating because they have great ideas they wanna share, right? They wanna compose, but they can't find the words that they need, so it's very frustrating. And then finally, as I said before, they don't have pre-writing strategies, so they just jump in and start writing or they freeze and they don't know how to get started. So those are just a few of the really common, common things we find. All right, so now let's begin to take our tour of the writing rope and I'm gonna tackle the first bottom two strands uh, first. And let's talk a little bit more about transcription skills. Um, you know, for those of you who understand the, the, the point in reading that if students aren't fluent in their decoding skills by the time they leave third grade, right? What happens? They struggle to just read the words on the page. It takes a lot of energy away from their ability to focus on making meaning. Well, it's the flip side with writing. If our, our students are spending so much time and cognitive energy remembering how to spell words or trying to form the letters in handwriting or really bogged down in keyboarding, it takes away energy from being able to focus on the composing part. So now both sides, of what you see here require explicit instruction, but I've kind of separated out. And I also want to say that I think, I believe that transcription skills, handwriting, spelling, right? 
are actually, especially in the elementary grades, best taught during a phonics lesson. Because what do students need to know to spell? They need to know the alphabetic principle. They need to know the English orthography system. And so when we're in our phonics lessons, teaching them letter sound symbol correspondences, uh, various phonics concepts and patterns, right? We should be doing decoding at the same time we're doing encoding, which is spelling. Now, if the students are older and they're still having trouble with spelling, then the intervention time should fo focus on this alphabetic principle for spelling. The other side, though, is where I think most of the work that has to do with writing falls, and that is everything involved with composing, generating your ideas or getting information to write about, organizing them, finding the best words, right? Being able to write a good sentence and then into a paragraph, right? Awareness of tap. So transcription is really important, but it's more a matter of becoming fluent so we can focus on composing. Now, this is one of the items that I put in the um, <clears throat> writing craft. I mentioned before task audience purpose. And uh, here's a very simple example. If you're writing um, a text message or maybe an email to a member of your family, you're gonna write it very differently than if you're writing it to your boss, right? You're going to be thinking about the words you use, um, lots of decisions that get made. And many of our students don't even think about this. They are not aware. So that's one of the things we have to instruct and give them practice with. A uh, little bit more about writer's craft. It's sometimes also called writer's moved, moves or the art of writing. It's really anything that a writer does on purpose to make the writing look or sound a certain way, right? And so it, it can do with tone or voice or aware, audience awareness, even how we organize. So this slide just kind of hits the mountaintops for you of some of the things that are involved with writing craft. I mentioned before writer's voice, which is also described as writing from the heart, and it's how you choose your words. Um, I want you to think about anytime you've ever read a story that begins something like this, it was a dark and scary night, right? Like you're already starting to feel a certain way about this story. And that's a perfect example of a voice and what that creates. Um, it's, it's making sure we're very purposeful in the words that we use and making sure our, our words are very precise and colorful, right? And then a whole host of literary devices. How do you use figure language? As kids get older, do you put fat flashbacks, right? Now, all of this, to me, I feel a lot of it is the icing on the cake with writing, okay? Because I feel that if students don't have basic skills in all those other strands of the rope, like this, you get to at the end. If you can't write a good sentence, then don't worry about, um, you know, making people feel, feel something with your writing. So this does tend to be the purview of writing instruction or ELA. Now, here's one of the tangible takeaways I want you to have. Um, I mentioned in that review of the research that one of the findings is that when we use mentor models of writing, it's effective. So what does that mean? Well, we all know that we emulate others. That's how we grow our writing. And I will give you a very simple example. I want you to think of a time in the last two months that you had to write something for personal or work and you looked at how somebody else wrote the same thing to get some ideas, right? So uh, an example I, I give is I was once in a, not too long ago, in a car accident and I had to write, go to the police station to write a, a re accident report and I did, did not write one. So what do you think I asked? I said, can I see a few reports? I looked at how other people wrote them and then it's like, all right, I get this. And, and that's the concept I want you to have here, right? Now, the problem with the way models are sometimes used or have been used, um, especially in, let's just say, less explicit approaches to teaching writing, right, that you might find um, in a traditional writer, writer's workshop, let's say, it, teachers show models of good writing, but they don't explicitly help the kids figure out what's going on in the writing in order to emulate it. Or they do things like, 
read this beautiful poem. Isn't it wonderful? Now I'd like you to write a poem. It doesn't work that way, right? So my takeaway for you is if you're going to use a mentor model, you want to focus on what are you trying to teach? Are you teaching about structure? Maybe you want kids to know what a good paragraph should look like. So then go and find three or four mentor models of beautifully written paragraphs, but then you've got to analyze them with the students and say, what did that writer do? What makes it a good paragraph? Now let's emulate that in our paragraphs. Maybe you want to show students how to use transition words to connect sentences. We'll show them a few examples. And the thing about mentor models is you can also show them examples of other stages. You can show them examples of what good notes look like, right? Or what a good graphic organizer looks like. So that's my takeaway for you. Any one of the things that you see on this rope that we're gonna be talking about, you can find some mentor examples, analyze them with your kids and let them use that as a scaffold to then emulate in their writing. Okay, so now let's move up to the text structure. And as I said before, there's quite a few things tucked in under here. We're going to start first with the three types of writing. And, you know, a lot of our kiddos don't get what these three things are or how they're different. Um, and so sometimes just a little handout like this or an anchor chart in your classroom to remind students what the three main types are and their purpose. Um, and by the way, sometimes writers go and combine multiple. Um, if you think about, for example, a, um, a, a, a um, oh gosh, an editor, I forgot the word, an editorial in a newspaper, right? You know, the editorial might start off by giving you some information about a crime, let's say, right? And then it might shift to telling you events in the crime, which is becomes narrative. And then at the end, because it's an editorial, they might pose their opinion about that crime or what should be done about it. So we sometimes can combine different these three different types, but we need to first make sure that students understand the difference differences among them. And also how they're structured differently. And I'm gonna get to that in a minute with um, a takeaway strategy for you to use to help kids plan the structure of a writing piece. Um, but the one thing that I that I wanna say before I leave this slide is that we know that when teachers teach kids about text structure, it not only helps their writing, but it also helps their comprehension. So if we can have students learn and understand what an introduction does and a conclusion, um, what things like um, headings and titles do, right? And we can have students study that or practice that by looking at the text we're having them read. It's called reading like a writer, where we take advantage of what they're reading and we take a few moments to unpack the structure so that the students can then turn around and try to emulate that structure in their own writing. Now, here's the takeaway activity or tool, I guess, that I want to give you. Um, how many of you, of you have heard of the five paragraph essay, right? Been along now for a long time. And if you've ever seen a graphic organizer of it kind of works something like this, there's five boxes. The first box is your introductory paragraph. The last box is your concluding paragraph. And the three middle boxes are your three body paragraphs. I'm sure you've all seen that. Now, it's not that there's something wrong with that because it, it does remind us that we need introductions and conclusions. The problem is it's very limited, right? In fact, you often hear college professors say that um, too many of their students head up into college and everything they write is a five paragraph essay, right? Well, what if you needed five paragraphs in the body? Or what if you only needed one? Or what if your introduction only needs to be a sentence or maybe it needs to be a whole page? So. This is a different kind of graphic organizer I'm gonna share with you. Um, I know even in a short amount of time when I show the examples that I show you, I know that you're gonna be able to go off and get some ideas and start to use this with kids. So let's walk our way through it. All right, the first thing I wanna point out is, you see that first graphic organizer? That's the one we use at the start, it's the default. 
for either informational or opinion argument, right? So we put the topic of what we're writing or what we're giving an argument about. We build out our intro, we build out our conclusion, and then we're gonna build out our body. If we are writing narrative, then the default is the bottom one where you've got beginning, middle, and end. Now, the reason we start with this is that it's really important that kids remember these major pieces. If you take a look at the 10 writing standards in Common Core and many similar state standards, the first three are about those three types of writing that I mentioned, but all of them have substandards that begin as early as second grade that say kids have to be able to write intros and conclusions. So the first thing this does is remind them that they need to do that. But what's gonna vary in these topic webs is how you build out your body based on the structure. So let's use, this is a generic example. This is for informational writing. Now we know that the bare minimum for an introduction is to introduce your topic. So tell us what you're writing about. And in the conclusion, you gotta restate that and give us some closure. So those are like the, the basics. I want you to focus on how the body gets built out. Informational text is organized hierarchically by topics and subtopics. I want you to think about a social studies textbook or a science textbook and you look at every chapter. It's grouped by sections and then each section has a subsection, right? And you get down and they even have different, they have headings that change in size, right? Until you get down to this one little last section that has maybe three to eight paragraphs in it, right? So our body is gonna be organized hierarchically. Now this one represents a fairly short writing piece. It's probably a one sentence intro, a one or two sentence conclusion. But how many body paragraphs are there? Four, because there's four main ideas and every time you switch a new main idea, you create a new paragraph. What if we have to write something a little bit longer? So this is something that might be a page, a page and a half, maybe two pages. It could have a whole paragraph for an introduction, maybe a whole paragraph for the conclusion, but what do you notice about the body? There's two major topics and then body paragraphs under each of those. So if you keep these generics in mind, I'm gonna show you two student examples. This one is from a middle school. You can see the teacher gave the student the, the default shapes. Uh, the student's writing about what? How rocks are formed. Conclusion comes back. They're formed in many ways, but look at the body. So this has got three chunks to it. Um, it could very well be that each one of those strands there becomes a section with a heading. The first one looks like it'll probably have about two paragraphs, could be more. Middle one, three paragraphs. Last one, one. Here you can see an example from a high school class. Students were writing about the access powers in World War II. This could easily be turned into a three or four page paper. What you don't put in your topic webs are all the details. It's just the big ideas and how they're gonna be organized in your writing piece. All right, so how does this look when we're writing opinion or narrative? Well, you still need to tell your topic and you need to provide closure, but an additional thing that's necessary with um, opinion or argument is you have to state your op opinion, your position or your claim. So that's gonna go up in your intro and you wanna make sure you go back and restate it at the end. <clears throat> but the body is gonna be organized differently. So when we write arguments or opinions, there's five major components that we have to address. The first after is our claim, right? Then we have reasons that support the claim. And for every reason, we have to provide evidence, facts, figures, right, quotes. Now, in upper level writing, we have two more. We have a counterclaim where you take the position that the other side might take, and then you provide a rebuttal. So those are the five components. Now, in the early grades where kids are just doing opinion, they're not required to do counterclaims yet. So if we look at this, you'll notice that the body is organized not hierarchically with topics and subtopics, 
it's organized by reasons. So in this case, the student has got three reasons to support that opinion. And here you can see an example. This is a grade four students using this. The student is writing about the position that they think the younger kids should get two recesses a day. They were actually writing this to the principal of their school. How many reasons does the student have? And you can see them right there. Now, this is probably gonna turn into three body paragraphs, one for each reason. We don't have all the evidence or the supporting details because that's not the purpose of a top-down web. Now, when we do move into the upper grades, and now you can see in the body, we've got reasons, but we've also got the counterclaim and rebuttal. And this could go in any order, by the way. So you might give your first reason, then give your counterclaim, and then your rebuttal, and then give two more reasons, or five reasons, or eight reasons, right? And the point is that the details are provided afterwards. So I'm going to show you an example, an upper example. In this case, the student was uh, making the case that NASA should continue to receive the budget that it has. I want you to look at the other things the student has put in the introduction, right? They're giving some facts about the budget, right? Talking about some projects. So it's sort of background information, but they're definitely stating their claim. And this student has got two main reasons. All right, last but not least, um, I mentioned the narrative. And so this is beginning, middle, end. Almost always in the beginning of a narrative, you want to establish some situation. You introduce the narrator or a character or the setting. And so that sort of kicks your narrative off. The ending provides closure. And very often there's like a problem and a solution in narrative. And so the solution gets revealed at the end. Like, how are you gonna wrap the story up? But look at the body. The body is organized by events. This only has four events. It's a pretty short story, right? If you were writing a whole novel, you might have 350 events organized into chapters, but you're still building on this structure. So that's my takeaway as it relates to a tool you can use to help kids organize their writing before they jump into the write stage. What we're going to do now is focus a little bit on instructional suggestions for paragraphs. Now, one of the reasons even our older students have trouble writing is because they still don't get what a paragraph is. And we don't talk in paragraphs. It's something kind of unique to writing. But basically, the reason we either indent or skip a line to start a new paragraph is because we're shifting the main idea. We might have the same topic. So maybe I'm writing a piece about pirates. But every time I switch to something different, maybe the first paragraph I write about buccaneer pirates, the next one I write about pirates of the Caribbean, it's all about pirates, right? But every time we change the main idea, we got to start a new paragraph. And a lot of our kids don't get that. Now, I'm sure you've all seen things like the hamburger visual or the temple, right? Where the top bun is the intro, the topic sentence to the paragraph, the bottom is the concluding, and all the stuff in the middle is the supporting sentences, right? This is okay when we're teaching this to our young ones. But the fact of the matter is, when we actually start reading, most of the paragraphs we read do not have concluding sentences at the end of every paragraph. Nor when we're writing a multi-paragraph piece, should we have a concluding sentence for every paragraph. We do need, it is helpful to provide a topic sentence at the start of each paragraph to let the reader know the main idea of the paragraph, but we do not need a concluding sentence you're more likely gonna have an introductory statement at the beginning of your multi-paragraph piece. You'll have a concluding statement at the end, and then these body paragraphs, however many you have, will just have those topic sentences. Now, it is true that a lot of what we read, there are no topic sentences. The main ideas are implied and we have to infer them. But our, what we want, kids to learn is how to write a good solid paragraph before they start reading off their topic sentences. Now there are multiple activities and things that you can do to help develop this uh, sentence, I'm sorry, paragraph work. I'm only gonna show you one example because we, we don't have a lot of time, 
But on that front cover of your handout packet, I've given you links to a bunch of blog posts and whatnot that I've written. One of them was called The Mighty Paragraph, where I give ex examples of how to teach all of what you see here. But I want to I want to focus on this. This is a good takeaway for you. So it, it's using color coding. This also gives me an example to share with you a little bit about uh, using another mentor model. So I actually found this paragraph in a middle school textbook and I it, re, it caught my eye because it, it's a perfectly structured paragraph, right? It's got a topic sentence, concluding sentence. And so we take some samples, mentor models, and we analyze them with kids. We say, is there a topic sentence? Where is it? Let's highlight it in green, wherever it might be. Is there a conclusion? If there is, highlight it in red or pink, right? Any supporting details, we're going to make yellow. And so you do this in, within the mentor text so they can see how paragraphs are structured. And then eventually it shifts to the you do it stage and you have students then color coordinating their own paragraphs. And that's what this is, an example of a student written paragraph where the student's done the highlighting. Uh, another thing under this strand of the rope is those patterns of organization that I mentioned. There are five major patterns. You can see them all here. Um, and under each one is an explanation of kind of its purpose, right? So again, a simple anchor chart like this on the wall in your classroom or a handout or something made available if you have electronic handouts so that kids know that these are different purposes and structures they can use in their writing. And then what goes hand in hand is the transitions that I mentioned to you, right? These are worth their weight in gold. Transitions help us make links from sentences to sentence and then paragraph to paragraph, but they also signal those patterns. And one of the things I've given you here is a link to that list of transitions that you see on the slide. Now, I have been giving this out since 1978. Um, I used to give it out as handouts. Now, because I have a website, people can grab it for free, and I hope you will do that. Um, I want you to notice the transitions are organized by a purpose. So you look for your purpose on the left side, and then it gives you some hints about some good transitions. You want to make these transitions available to kids. Make them in front of them. Put them on posters. You also see an example of a poster that Keys to Literacy sells. I'm not trying to sell posters. Don't You don't have to buy the poster. Make your own, right? But the idea is you have these transitions in front of the kids, and the ones that have the lowest language skills, these don't come naturally to them and it serves as a scaffold until it becomes part of their writing. So these transitions are just really helpful. All right, um, we're gonna say a little bit about syntax sentences and end with critical thinking in a moment. But earlier I said that I believe sentences and paragraphs are like the building blocks of writing. So I want to use this slide to share a little metaphor with you using Lego blocks. If you imagine each of those blocks is a word, how do we create a sentence? Well, we string a bunch of Lego blocks together. Now we have to be careful of the order, right? That's what grammar is. So if I want to describe my desk, I put my adjective in front of my, de my noun. So I say the flat brown desk. If it was a romance language, I would say the desk flat brown. But that doesn't sound right, right? So what we're trying to build is syntactic awareness, the order. And one of the things we can do that really helps that is sentence combining, which I'll get to in a minute. But if you think about it, that's how we build a sentence, right? It might be a really long sentence, but it's a sentence. How do we build a paragraph? Well, we take several of those sentences. So imagine a bunch of those Lego blocks. Now we're sticking them next to each other. And that's a paragraph because they're all related. You know, the really big Lego blocks with a lot of little holes in it? What if we put that on top and press down on all those strands? That's like the introduction or the topic sentence to our paragraph, right? And then how do we build something longer? Well, if we've got one of those, you, you see how big those, that, 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 what we're building now? If we take a bunch of those paragraphs and we put them all together, that gives us a multi-paragraph piece and we could take one of the really big ones and put it on top. And that's our intro to the whole piece. And we could put one on the bottom and that's our conclusion. So I found that with some students who don't understand how you get from words to a book, 
this can be a very helpful metaphor. So in this strand, we're trying to develop that syntactic awareness, right? And our goals for sentence writing should be to get kids to write quality sentences quickly and fluently, and also to get them to take their short, simple sentences and make them longer and more elaborated. Um, this is a quote from Bruce Sadler, who's done a lot of work with, with sentence instruction. And I, I really like the way he puts this, that, you know, of, of the many difficulties writers have, right, it's crafting a sentence that's just right. And if you think about your own revision, my guess is a lot of what you go in and revise when you're writing is right down on the sentence level. So there are several activities we can do to build sentence sense. I'm gonna share a little bit about sentence combining. We don't have time to do all of it, but I've given you a link to a two-part blog that I wrote about two years ago, where I take every one of these things and um, show you how to do it. So let's drill down on sentence combining. Remember this keeps showing up in the research as very helpful. It actually improves the writing of kindergarten right up through college level, been around for a long time. And here's how it works. So at the very basic level, you take two simple sentences like this, and can you put it into one sentence? And maybe you come up with something like this, right? Or we could take these two. What might you come up with? Something like this. So this is very easy. But you know what? If you're a first and second grader, this is not, not so easy, right? And you might even have to do this with the young ones orally if they can't yet read the words. And eventually, I think I have another example here. There we go. But eventually, I want you to see just how complex this can get and challenging. So this is on the other end. What I did was I took a very uh, complex sentence from a science textbook and broke it out into these shorter, simpler sentences. Now, we don't have time to do this tonight, but if I were to ask you to combine this into one longer, complex but syntactically correct sentence, I know you could do it. It would probably take you two minutes. But my point is, whether you start with the very simple, the book was good, the movie was good, or something this complex, all of these are examples of sentence combining. You would never jump to this until your kids could do the simpler sentence combining. So it's a very powerful tool, and I highly recommend you start using it with students. All right, so that brings us to the last strand. And I mentioned before about the stages of the writing process. Uh, we developed at Keys to Literacy a little acronym to help kids remember that they need to go through all these stages, right? It's called the process writing routine. And the letter of each of those words represents think, plan, write, revise. What you see um, in this handout is some of the sub steps that happened at, happen at each of those. But the point is we really wanna make sure that our students don't skip any of these stages. Now I have a copy of this in your handout packet on page four. So, and you might ask, what's the arrow for? Well, we also wanna teach kids that, well, you definitely start by thinking, you know, what are you gonna write out, write about, gather some information. Then you definitely have to plan then you're gonna write and then you're gonna revise. The fact of the matter is good writers are always recycling. And that's what the arrow reminds us. We might have to go back and do some more thinking or do some more planning. Um, and I'm gonna leave you with a couple slides about writing to read and writing to learn and writing about text. So remember at the very beginning, I shared this slide, the research about how writing helps reading, right? And we talked about writing summaries, writing personal reactions, notes. Um, and so the reason we're gonna do this is that writing is thinking. When we write, it makes us think. So very simple example, how many of you write a grocery list before you go to the supermarket, okay? Now, what if you forget it at home? The fact that you wrote it, doesn't it help you remember? what you need to get. And that's the point. It puts things into our long-term memory. It helps us make co connections, even little short, quick writes like writing a list. Now, if we are gonna teach students these skills, we've gotta be explicit. 
we might have to teach them how to annotate text sources if they're writing from sources, right? How do you highlight? How do you take notes on your text? We have to teach them how to gather it into notes. Got to teach them note taking. Then we have to teach them things like maybe that top-down web, right? Or graphic organizer to organize what you have to say. Then we've got to do all that work with teaching them sentences and paragraphs so that they can write good, good paragraphs. They need to know about text structure, right? We have to teach them revising and editing. The point is we can't just say, here's some text. I want you to answer this question, right? Or listen to this video and write, write a response to this prompt. We've got to explicitly teach the skills that go along with it. And summarizing is one of those things. Um, you saw it over and over again in the research. We got to teach kids what it is, how to state the main ideas and to create your summary. We've got to model it and use think aloud. We might give kids something like this, something very specific. Here's how you write a summary. So with that, I'm going to wrap this up so we have at least a few minutes for Q&A. A few points I want to make. Number one, writing instruction must address multiple components. You can now see what they are in the writing group. All teachers can play a role. You can do this in a lot of this in any subject. We must be explicit using an I, we, you, and mentor models. And the last thing I'll leave with is we want to avoid a suicide. It's not a real word, but it's when teachers assume that kids have these skills when they don't. So I'm gonna leave this up while we do some Q&A so that you can grab uh, the links. They're also on the handout packet to my blog posts and the free instructional resources. So Reading League folks, do we have some questions that you wanna ask? We do, we do have a few questions. Um, a couple of them are kind of related. Um, Molly asked, she has a lot of kids in kindergarten through second grade who struggle with incorrect letter formation. Is it a good idea to spend some time correcting that or should you just let it go? Well, so I think, I think you have to think about what's the purpose of the lesson. So if it's to teach them handwriting and practice handwriting, which as I said before, a lot of that can and should be happening in the phonics lesson as students are learning their letters, the capitals and the smalls, right? And they're learning letter sound correspondences. We know that if they learn to form the letters while they're learning the sounds that are associated with them, it, it supports all kinds of things. So in that instance, you absolutely have to correct them so that they, they don't develop you know bad habits, right? On the other hand, and, and I think you said this person was first grade? Is that, uh, kindergarten say? through kindergarten. second okay. grade. Yeah. yeah. So if, on the other hand, you're having your students begin to compose, and by the way, we compose in kindergarten through our drawings, and gradually we add a word to our drawing, maybe a phrase, right? We use invented spelling. So if the student's spelling or handwriting isn't great at that point, you don't want to focus on that because that sends a message that you're not really valuing what they have to say in their drawing. So now you might, when it's all said and done, go back in as some revision and say, you know what, let's take a look at the way you wrote the letter W. We've been learning that it's got three points, right? And then maybe go in and correct, but I wouldn't do it while the student is in the middle of composing and using the drawing to orally say what the drawing represents. I hope that that makes sense. Yeah, and with so if you're in, um, say you're in, you're doing composing writing, um, and you have kids who still are not fluent with their transcription skills, are there some scaffolds that you would suggest using so that they can participate during that writing block without letting their um, their lack of transcription skills um, impede that? Yeah, that's a great, great point. And I think part of the answer depends on the grade level of the student, right? So if they're younger, early elementary grades, um, then that's why we do a lot of transcribing for kids. So they, they begin with their drawing and we, we want to encourage them to add as much detail to their drawing. That's, that's part of revision, by the way, right? Then we have them use that as their scaffold to orally explain what they're composing. And an adult transcribe. So if they're really young, that's one way that you can do that. If they're in high school and one of my sons, you know, ha had an issue with this, right? 
Um, what we that's where you can use adaptive technology. So you can use speech to print where the student is able to compose verbally and then it transcribes it for you. Um, and then there's kind of e everything in between. Right, right. Um, are the, where is a good place to look? Wendy was asking a question when you were talking about um, using mentor texts. What's a good place to look when you're looking for a mentor text um, to use for a particular purpose? Yeah, well, you know, if you do an internet internet search, mentor text, right? <laughs> right. So much stuff comes up, right? But but I, I think it's more a matter of just being on the lookout. It's like once you're aware of the value of mentor text, you know, as teachers, we're always seeing things and grabbing them and saving them. We, we've got filing cabinets of stuff everywhere, right? And so once you start to think about it, remember I said the example about the science, the paragraph in the science book. Um, so I think if you can make a list um, each month of, all right, what are the particular writing skills or strategies or techniques you want to focus on? And then just be on the lookout. It's everywhere. It's in the text all around us. Um, you can also go back and use student writing samples. You have to bl block out their names, but um, those are really good sources as well. So there's lots of stuff out there. The problem I see with what you get on the internet is that they tend to do that, that like, here's a good example of a, of a story, right? Or an opinion piece. And there's too much going on. You, you're, you're writing Mo models can sometimes be just like a little paragraph or a couple sentences. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're we're kind of running out of time. So I just wanted to do this last question because I think this would solve a lot of uh, issues for a lot of people. Sure. Uh, Deb is asking, do you have an in-depth online course that you could recommend um, that people could um, sign up for and, and take, you know, it, it takes a while to absorb all this information, right? So yeah. Is there, yeah. what would you suggest that they sign up for? Yeah, well, the first thing I would suggest, and you have the links to this, to these free archived webinars on the handout. So at the Keys website, um, oh, especially with the advent of COVID, uh, we and at Keys, but I did a, lo a lot of them, we have a whole collection of uh, archived webinars where like there's one whole one just on note taking, right? So, and those are all free. They're all about an hour each. That's a great place to start. There's one there, uh, Keys to Early Writing. It's a great overview uh, about, and we talk a lot more about drawing and uh, word lists and all. So that that's one thing. Um, but obviously, you know, Keys to Literacy, that's what we do, professional development. Um, so there are a couple of courses. You actually see some of the titles there. So we have a Keys to Early Writing. It's the equivalent of two days of training. Uh, and that's for K to two teachers. We have keys to content writing. There's an elementary and upper grades version. That's the equivalent of two days training. That training, we go to schools and do it on site. We do it using Zoom. But I also have matching online asynchronous courses. So we have a lot of people who get the training just by taking the asynchronous online course. Um, there are training books for all of these things. And so we also have some people, they just buy the books and they, they learn from the books or they do a book study, or maybe they take the online course, which comes with the book. And, you know, so, uh, there's, there's all kinds of ways that you can access, but it's basically the keys to early writing and the keys to content writing, uh, that, that really get at the writing. Awesome. I think that that's one of our goals when we do these um, online sessions is to get people interested in these topics so that they pursue them more. We can't possibly, um, you know, cover everything in depth. Um, yeah. But um, I, I think that that, um, that further, there are so many options here on this final slide that I would suggest that people look into that. Um, somebody's asking, is this being recorded? Um, yes, it is. And it would be posted on the YouTube channel of the Reading League Wisconsin. Make sure you go to the Reading League Wisconsin, not just the Reading League, because that's our parent organization. So this will be on our Wisconsin YouTube channel. Um, uh, I just put in the link. Um, there's a form to receive your certificate of attendance this evening. We were so happy that everyone could join us and experience the wonderful information that Joan has been able to provide with um, the writing rope and writing itself. And Mary, Sarah, I want to thank you so much for hosting this and um, 
you know, being the facilitators. Thank you. And thanks to everybody for spending your evening with me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Joan. Thanks, Joan. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.